So at the, at the beginning of May, um, and many of you may have been here for this, I moderated a panel right on this stage uh, with the founding chairman of Hong Kong's uh, Democratic Party, Martin Lee, uh, the young activist and elected then deposed legislator Nathan Law, uh, and a longtime journalist and press freedom act advocate, uh, Ma Kin Ting. And the subject was Beijing's relationship with Hong Kong. Right. And, uh, and I introduced that panel by saying that Hong Kong then was embroiled in what seemed to be a sort of peak moment of fierce political contestation uh, over proposed changes to its laws uh, on the extradition of fugitives. That was before a million Hong Kong people uh, took to the streets to protest those laws. That was before another two million people took to the streets to protest that legislation, uh, before the storming and dis defacing of uh, LegCo, where you both work, uh, before the erection of uh, Lenin walls by the protesters, which tie their uh, movement to uh, anti-communist demonstrations in Prague in 1980, uh, before they gathered to sing songs from Les Miserables that link them to the anti-monarchists of France in the 1830s, uh, before the riot gas, uh, the riot police and the tear gas, but before the shutdown of the airport that almost kept you from coming here, uh, before Beijing's liaison office in Hong Kong called the actions of the protesters atrocities and the activists no different to terrorists, uh, and before the U.S. president warned that PRC troops were massing at Hong Kong's border, or called the protest riots, or said he hoped the Hong Kong thing works out for everybody. <laughs> so uh, it feels like we're in a, just a completely different world from three months ago. And I wonder if I could start by asking each of you to give us your sense for what these three months have been like for you and what you think it's most important to pay attention to in trying to understand what's happening. Sure. Yeah, um, we'll, maybe we'll start with yours. that one. Yeah, so... Uh, First of all, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susie, and uh, thank you all for coming over, and thank you, Asia, Asia Society, for hosting us. Um, well, the past few months had changed Hong Kong dramatically. Uh, as Susie, you mentioned, uh, in the last occasion when Martin Lee and Nathan Law were here, it was a different Hong Kong. Um, what happened over the past few months? Of course, to give you a brief background in case some of you are not entirely familiar with what's happening in Hong Kong, it's all about an extradition law. Simply speaking, we do not send suspect to China for trial for obvious reasons. There's a lack of rule of law, there's no protection of human rights, and of course, there's no fair trial. So Hong Kong restricts uh, sending any suspect to China for that reasons. And earlier this year, Carrie Lam wants to remove that restrictions. And we said it's wrong. Not only the Democrats say it's wrong, not only the legal professions say it's wrong, but also international community, including Chamber of Commerce from around the world, including the American Chamber of Commerce. Because it's simply not something that suits in with the one country, two systems spirit. And over the past few months, we had had a lot of marches against this bill. And most significantly, that took place in early June. On the 9th of June, we had the first million people march that took to the street in a peaceful manner. A week later, we had another one with double the size. Two million people took to the street in a peaceful manner against the bill. And over the past two months, we have seen countless, countless uh, numbers of police brutality uh, against protesters. Uh, Dennis and I have prepared some photos just to show you a bit of what happened uh, over the past two months, including this one I'm holding. Uh, we, have this, we see two young uh, people, a, a man here and a woman here. For the man, he was shot in the eye uh, on the 12th of June. He lost his sight uh, by around 50%. He can still see things. The less fortunate is to the girl. Over the past weekend, uh, there were uh, bin bat bullets shooting at her eye and she lost her right eye. This is done by the police. Um, over the past two months, I've been on the ground, front line. I had a lot of tear gas. This picture is just one of them, having tear gas in neighborhood residential area. 
what Dennis is holding, right here, police firing tear gas inside a metro station, inside a metro station. Can you imagine? Now, um, apart from police brutality, what we want to bring to the attention of the international community is that triads were used. I would say, I would use the word used by uh, uh, the government in collusion with the police uh, to beat uh, using uh, sticks and other weapons to attack ordinary Hong Kong citizens without selection, without discrimination. They uh, basically, uh, there was a night of terror that has been experienced by the Hong Kong people in Yunlong. And this is what's happening. And we, uh, the Hong Kong people, want to show the world that this is what uh, uh, Hong Kong has descended uh, down to. And to give you a brief idea, uh, over the past two months, police have fired over 1,800 rubber uh, tear gas to the people, almost 30 per day, and with rubber bullets and, uh, and other weapons. And up to, up to this moment, over 700 people got arrested for different charges, including riot, unlawful assembly, assaulting of police officers, etc. Whereas the triads uh, are still out at large, uh, none of them has been uh, uh, arrested and charged with uh, uh, offense. So the legal profession and the Hong Kong people are very concerned about what we're starting to see, selective political prosecution against protesters, whereas the other people are getting away scot-free. Can you explain how you see the mechanisms that are allowing this to happen or that are actively encouraging it to happen? You mean the police brutality? The police brutality and the, yes. and the selective uh, well, trials. Um, the I mean, there are, how many police are there in Hong Kong? 30,000, 30, 30, right? Yeah. And so there are a million people, yeah. there's sometimes a million people on the Well, Elvin has talked about the police brutality, but um, I, I also want to talk about um, how the system of government has consistently failed the Hong Kong people over the 20 years. And what we've seen in the past two months is all those challenges, all those problems and uh, discontentment uh, coming to a head. Where the Hong Kong people, of course, the, it was the extradition bill that started this all. But um, that basically brought up all the problems that uh, Hong Kong has faced over the past 20 years and how the system of government no longer command any respect, trust uh, of the Hong Kong people, especially amongst the young people. Um, and this co it comes down to uh, a single problem of a democratic deficit, that we do not have full democracy in Hong Kong as promised under the basic law. And uh, people are uh, sick and tired of one bad chief executive after another, after another, and another. That, um, that I think the Hong Kong people feel, and rightly so, that we deserve a much better government, a much better political leadership, which we're not seeing. I think, I mean, so, some of those things have clearly been true for a long time. So I'd, I'd just be interested in hearing your take on kind of at what point the protests escalated mm -hmm. and sort of assumed the nature that they have now. Was that was there? After the first million person march, um, could Carrie Lam have have mm -hmm. essentially diffused diffused the protests by agreeing to completely drop the extradition yeah. law? Well, and, yeah. and like, sort of, when did it morph into something that was no longer about the uh, the extradition law? Well, in a reasonable world, in a world that we all live in, we were we would be have, you know expecting that a sensible politician would have conceded to one million people demand so clearly against a bill. Mm -hmm. But on that very day, at around 10.30, uh, the organizers called the end of the march. Everybody was going home. At 11 o'clock, the chief executive issued a statement claiming that I respect you, but sorry. I will go ahead with the bill and proceed with the legislative procedure on the coming Wednesday. So how respectful could that be? 
And on the 12th. Do you assume that she was ordered specifically to make that statement by well, the government in Beijing? I don't do think, think so. She- I, I do not believe that she is uh, does not have the discretion to uh, withdraw the extradition bill. All that is required is a letter to the president of the Legislative Council saying we'll withdraw it. Up to today, she has refused to make that eminently sensible step. And a lot of people have been asking us, you know, how do we uh, end the protests? What is the end game? You know, all I think the people are demanding, are still demanding, is the formal withdrawal of the bill. And more importantly, uh, the setting up of an independent commission led by a judge to look into all the public events that has taken place, um, and, and a few others. But I think those are the key ones. And she has so far refused to withdraw the bill uh, and set up an independent commission. And that is why people feel, you know, uh, you, you keep saying, you, oh, you listen to the views of the Hong Kong people. We respect you. In fact, that's the very last, last thing that the Hong Kong people feel. Do you think she sees the protests as primarily motivated by some of the um, economic problems in Hong Kong? Well, to give you a brief uh, background. Shortage of housing, yeah. low job prospects, economic right. in- inequality. Yeah. So right now, Hong Kong is enjoying a very low unemployment rate, around 2.9%. This almost full employment. Uh, over the past a year or so, we have had some growth, not extremely well, but <coughs> You know, around 1% of growth that is similar to any uh, uh, developed economies. Uh, of course, definitely we have a very high property price, and that, is, uh, that makes Hong Kong almost one of the most unbearable places to have your own property, indeed. But does it mean that Hong Kong will be happy, especially the young ones, will be happy and stop taking to the streets and uh, uh, satisfied if they all get public housing? Well, that is not the case. And to give you a brief idea, uh, this very morning, when I woke up, I read um, from the news that the financial secretary of Hong Kong, Paul Chen, had just announced a new plan to cut taxes. Well, does it mean that will help the protesters from uh, going to the street and against the government? Of course not. It's a political issue, and as Dennis mentioned a bit earlier, it's the system that fails Hong Kong people. It's a lack of trust and confidence that people no longer believe in the political system. So this is why that I do not think the economic issue is the key to this protest. Some people say that uh, foreign, foreign forces uh, are the ones that motivated or instigated all this. I think the people who say That's that... That's the line from Beijing, yeah, right? uh, also well, in Hong Kong. You know, if you believe in that, you believe in anything. You believe Martian took Elvis. Um, <laughs> you know, and there's also an insult to the intelligence of the Hong Kong people to say that they are all, you know, the two million people were paid off by a foreign government. Uh, to, to go on and a march. Um, but there are other saying that um, this is uh, more thing into, you know, uh, uh, they, they say they call it the color revolution. All that, I think, is, is untrue. That the Hong Kong people, um, first of all, you know, the extradition bill, the demands are very clear. The, the public events, the police br- brutality, the use of triads are all totally unacceptable. But what's more importantly is that all the Hong Kong people want, and most of them just want democracy as promised under the basic law, which has been failed. That promise has failed. Um, and uh, all the problems of government, I think, um, uh, uh, the, the lack of legitimacy uh, stems from that. Do you, how, much, how much of a factor do you think Xi Jinping is? I mean, it, um, his amendments to China's constitution to extend his term limits, um, the incarceration of Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, the sort of general uh, crackdown on lawyers and the press and just the political climate in the mainland. Are, I mean, is that, is that something that protesters are talking about and thinking about, or, or are they mainly focused on the way that the protests have been treated it locally? Is, it has been a very domestic, local thing. Um, some ask, is this bill, the extradition bill, was initiated uh, from Beijing? No. Uh, from our observation, we believe that is a very Hong Kong thing. Over the past 20 odd years since the handover, nobody, no leader from Beijing has even openly mentioned about this extradition. The previous administrations in Hong Kong had never talked about a change of the extradition arrangement. So we do not believe that this is something that Beijing holds so dearly to their hearts. 
And for this particular saga that we are facing, of course, it goes all the way up to the president because he's the one who calls the shots at the end of the day. But we still believe that this is a very domestic issue. And if Carrie Lam could have compromised and agreed to our demands, as Dennis just mentioned, uh, that is to have an investigation uh, inquiry lo to look into police brutality, a lot of Hong Kong people would be happy with that. But on top of that, of course, we need a formal withdrawal and we need democracy as promised. But are, are we asking for the moon here? Are, are Hong Kong people being so unreasonable for having all these demands? No, not at all. So we do not believe that uh, uh, this is something so outrageous. I think, Susie, you are referring to the, the, the bigger picture uh, regarding how you know, uh, China under President Xi has changed and how that is affecting Hong Kong. I, I think you have a good point here. Um, what we've seen since uh, uh, 2012 when President Xi took to power is that, of course, the whole of China has become much more authoritarian, much more, much more so under his leadership. And that authoritarian system is creeping into Hong Kong in many different ways. So we're not just talking about the extradition bill, which Alvin has explained. We're talking about, we've seen abduction of booksellers. You've all read about it. You've, we've seen the disqualification of elected lawmakers uh, and candidates, the barring of political groups, the expulsion of foreign journalists. Uh, and uh, all these are, are what I see, signs of an authoritarian system creeping into Hong Kong. And we meant to have one country, two systems. Um, but what you're seeing in Hong Kong is, I would say, a contest between an authoritarian state uh, or an authoritarian system and the people who believe in liberal democratic values, who still believe in the rule of law, independence of judiciary, basic freedoms, human rights, and due process. And these two sets of values and systems are in the contest. And if you look at what's happening globally, I think Hong Kong is a good reflection of what we see globally, which is a contest between these two value systems, which I think Putin say that the, the liberal democratic values are now obsolete. Or there are those of us here who do not believe in that, who still believe that. The, uh, liberal democratic values are far better and the only way to go. And I think the Hong Kong people uh, want to retain those values and system. Yeah. I'm still stuck on this question, though, of whether this is... I mean, everything that you said has been true for a while, uh, but there haven't been a million people out protesting every weekend. Over, I mean, I was in Hong Kong for the, the demonstrations against uh, the... Um, Article 23 legislation, which would have introduced an anti-sedition law in Hong Kong. And that happened. The government responded, and then it kind of went away. And we've, uh, at least a lot of, a lot of us outside of Hong Kong, uh, and, and even people like me who've lived there, s sort of assumed that there was like a pretty high degree of political quiescence in, in, uh, in Hong Kong. And that, yes, people shared these values, but, uh, you know, they were kind of practical and they would get back to their business and their job. So I'm, ju I'm still curious about what you see as the sort of the key things that have um, changed, or is it that the, the protests just kind of at some point took on a life of their own? What, what caused this sort of dam to break? I would say people finally feel that, hey, this extradition bill is going to change the way of life Hong Kong is. And it's going to change one country to systems fundamentally, especially when it touches upon the legal system. People are worried. So not only ordinary people are worried, not only those supporters from the Democrats are worried, but including the business sector. Usually they were the ones who are relatively conservative or allies to the government. They spoke up as well, either local ones or the foreign ones. And especially when Hong Kong people learned that including the international community, foreign governments issued their concerns and warnings against Hong Kong governments over this bill, including Americans, uh, Canadians, New Zealand, Australians, and also the EU, they learned that, hey, this is something big. And this is, we have support from the international community against this very evil, controversial bill. So they spoke up and one, and after the first million people marched, they learned that when this government is not listening, they were angry. 
And so things accumulated one event after another. And I believe that youngsters of this generation, they know that they have to speak up. They know that they have to take it to their hands and try to make change. Of course, it's not easy. It's always an uphill battle. But then I, I do things, see things have changed quite dramatically. I just want to add one point. I don't think the Hong Kong people are apolitical or that they are, uh, you know, have no interest in political affairs. It's just that over the years, they've put up with a lot of things. They've been very tolerant. They put up with uh, bad government, bad leadership after another, but they still hope that things would work. But um, with the latest extradition saga, I think that has really woken up a lot of people to the fact that, look, if we don't do actively do something about this, then nothing will change. So since June, there's been how many? It's 400,000 new registration of uh, voters, most of them young people, right, Alvin? Yeah. And it's out of a population I, I, of 7 million now, yeah, 7. 5. 400,000 new registration. And uh, if all the people who came to the march, 2 million people come out to vote, I think it will, you will see uh, big things happening. So there are two elections coming up, one in November and one next year. And we want to channel that energy uh, uh, into something that um, the, the world can see in terms of election results. Speaking of the world watching, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what's happening in Beijing and what's happening in Washington, maybe first Washington. So uh, as I said a few minutes ago, there have been pretty mixed and confusing uh, uh, signals coming from Washington, uh, some very staunch uh, statements of support from members of uh, Congress, uh, then a statement uh, yesterday from our Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross that the Hong Kong protests were uh, an internal matter. Um, a tweet last night from, from Mr. Trump uh, noting somewhat cryptically uh, that he has zero, in all caps, doubt that uh, President Xi wants to quickly and humanely solve the Hong Kong problem. Uh, he can do it. Uh, and then personal meeting, question mark. So I wonder what role, if any, do you think that the U.S. and its current, current political configuration can play in how the protests unfold? Uh, could she, at this point, end them quickly and humanely? And, and what, what, I think what the key would that word entail? is humanely, right? Um, uh, there are many things that I don't agree with uh, what President Trump say. But um, you know, the, the humanely part is what I do agree. Um, I, I think it is important that the international community will continue to recognize and support Hong Kong as something that is different from mainland China. The concept of one country, two systems required the support and recognition of the international community. And the United States and other uh, 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 Western countries are very important in this respect. You all have a stake in Hong Kong. Uh, talking about the United States, you have billions of dollars of investments. A lot of American and American companies operate in Hong Kong. And it is an important strategic uh, point for international businesses. Uh, and for the international community to speak up for Hong Kong is extremely important. And uh, we see that across the American political establishment, you have people making statements of concern of Hong Kong. And I, I think those things do matter. And uh, those in power, uh, whether in the Hong Kong government uh, or in Beijing, although they would not openly admit it, they know how important it is that, that, that the Hong Kong Policy Act is for Hong Kong. Because without that recognition, without that special treatment and a separate customs territory, Hong Kong's status as an international financial center would not be able to maintain. But what we're seeing... So there's, there's yeah. new legislation that's right. being proposed yes. in, the, in the U.S. Congress that would alter... So Hong Kong has uh, a, a special status under a 1992 law that, that, create, that treats it, its trade and customs uh, separately from the rest of China. Yes. Um, and there's this new <laughs> proposed legislation that would make those special privileges uh, dependent on a re annual review of the health of its political institutions and its relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Beijing um, by the State Department. Uh, and uh, then there are a few other provisions. Have you, have you read yeah. this legislation? Yep. I'm You're talking about the human rights and uh, what, democracy It's called the Act. human rights, the Hong Kong human, right, human, human rights, rights and, and democracy. democracy yeah, we're, we're, of course, fully aware that uh, uh, the U.S. Congress will start deliberating uh, 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 on these bills quite soon uh, in September. And part of the purpose of this trip is we want to provide the, uh, the political establishment here with 
the facts that are, you know, what's happening on the ground in Hong Kong so that they would have the proper, I hope, the proper factual foundation when it comes to the deliberation of these bills, uh, which is entirely a matter for, for the U.S. Congress. But we um, think that it's important that they know what's happening on the ground. And it is, I think, if I'm, in the, I'm the Hong Kong government, I'll be extremely worried if uh, the U.S. Congress is starting to consider reviewing, putting conditions on these uh, 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 Hong Kong policy uh, and saying that, you know, you will not enjoy uh, the special treatment of the international community, especially the United States, if you continue to go down this path of undermining one country, two system, further and further away from its original design, you will naturally lose the special status. So it is extremely foolish for uh, uh, the Hong Kong government and those in Beijing to continue to pursue this uh, uh, policy direction. It seems like, though, Beijing has been pretty successful, at least from what I've been reading over the last few weeks, in convincing people in China um, that the U.S. is a, is a malign actor in this, that, it's, it, that it is stirring cult, uh, color revolution. Um, right there, there, there have been millions of posts on social media uh, in the mainland from mainlanders, very angry about the protests, very angry at Hong Kong. Um, and so I wonder two things about that. One, do you see that as capable of generating, I mean, there have been calls for boycotts of various Hong Kong and Taiwanese uh, companies in China. We've seen these firings at Cathay Pacific. Um, it seems like Beijing's strategy is to create popular pressure in the mainland that would be, begin to peel the business community uh, off of uh, any kind of support for the protest in ways that would make it much costlier for people in Hong Kong to support the protests or participate in the protests. Um, so I'm curious, uh, yeah, yeah. What, what you think about that. Yeah, um, Beijing is always very clever in trying to uh, convince um, Chinese people that you know there's always a foreign powers trying to uh, collude with uh, local politicians and overthrow uh, you know, the, uh, the Chinese administration. But again, this, they play the same tricks over and over and over again. But Hong Kong is no Beijing of 1989. We are now in 2019, and the world is watching. And when there's a free flow of information, when people can access, have access to, what, uh, to the truth in Hong Kong, then I think that helps Hong Kong people from defending ourselves. But I have to admit and confess that Beijing is, is very powerful in putting pressure on different businesses, including the Cathay Pacific. Uh, most recently, Cathay Pacific has just fired um, a pilot who was charged with rioting. But he's still innocent before proving guilty, right? But he's, he got fired because of that, because, because of the pressure. But then it all depends on how Hong Kong people can get united and stand behind ourselves and try to uh, pr protect our own businesses from all this pressure. It's not easy. There's no easy solution to this. But what I say is when people across the border in the mainland, when they have no access to the truth, when they can only understand the propaganda from Beijing, then I would say we in Hong Kong, we have to stay clear-minded and try to make sure that our people have a fair understanding of what's going on. Let me ask you this. If you had the um, ability, and obviously this is hypothetical, but if you had the ability to speak directly to people in mainland China, not the government, but ordinary people, people who um, believe um, you know, that, that you are um, bad people who are hurting China, um, what, what would you say to them? How, we'll say exactly the things that we've been saying openly. Uh, and we do come across uh, mainland officials from you know, our line of work and uh, uh, people from the mainland. And you know, we, we would say we have absolutely no hostility uh, towards the, the, the mainland, uh, 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 mainlanders. That we simply want our way of life, the Hong Kong way of life system and values to, to be preserved and to continue for our next generation. And yes, maybe we see things differently. But uh, what the, one of the interesting things is that uh, some of my friends are, are, are from the mainland, and they've been to settle in Hong Kong for a number of years. 
you know, they, they, they come to love the place like we do. And they see things, they begin to see things the way we see things. And they see the loveliness and special quality of Hong Kong. Uh, and they, they grow to, to, to love the place. So I think um, if people understand, um, if you, know, you want to see this as a color revolution, you want to see this as a separatist movement, you are completely wrong. Uh, if anyone is from the Chinese embassy uh, here, uh, you know, take this down. Okay, don't twist our words. We are for one country, two system. We want one country, two system to work, okay? Uh, and do not put labels on it and make things even more complicated. And you know, uh, you should know uh, that uh, the international community all has a stake in Hong Kong and that their support for Hong Kong is very important. And if Hong Kong does well uh, as an IFC, as a, 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 a society, and that is ultimately good for China as well. That, that is what I would say to anyone who thinks that this is something that is hostile or, or you know, uh, even revolutionary. Um, I, don't, I don't think they're reading it correctly. Well, just at one point, Hong Kong people are not demanding something that we do not deserve. And if you read the basic law, if you read the joint declaration uh, between Beijing and the UK signed in 1984, everything are there. You see, every, everything is just there and we are simply demanding something as promised. So we are not asking for something beyond what we deserve. So. Um, Yes, Dennis is right. Uh, representative from the Chinese embassy, don't put words in our mouth. <laughs> Before we open it up for, for questions from the audience, I, would, I just want to ask a couple more questions about how you think about how all this might end. Um, there was a news report overnight that there are um, um, people's armed police, that China's paramilitary, paramilitary forces uh, doing exercises in Shenzhen. Um, uh, a colleague of mine uh, uh, who writes for China File often uh, wrote something yesterday where he said, you know, when the, when the Communist Party is backed into a corner uh, and when authoritarian parties are backed into a corner, often violence is preferable to perceived political weakness or territorial mm -hmm. dissolution. Um, other people think the costs to Beijing would be uh, too high mm -hmm. for, of, of, of trying to suppress yeah. the protests with violence. Um, you know, and currently it feels like Beijing is trying to wage this war of attrition and, and peel, peel, peel off small, small groups of protesters. But um, yeah, what, yeah, we how are, likely do you think We are very concerned it, about this uh, potential use of force by the PLA or the PAP. You know, over the past few weeks, uh, we've seen uh, mainland officials openly saying, look, um, uh, uh, we, we we could use uh, uh, force in, in Hong Kong. It would be in accordance with the one country, two systems uh, if uh, troops are deployed. But I think the, you know, the underlying message is, of course, that uh, we won't use the troops, but we could if we want to. And that has caused a lot of concern uh, and fear amongst the Hong Kong people. Um, the last thing we want to see is PLA troops on the ground. That would completely destroy Hong Kong. It would be crazy. To, to send troops to, to Hong Kong and, you know, and make a, a second you know, Tiananmen Square uh, uh, massacre. I think it would be completely wrong. And, um, but they are sort of making all these soundings, which, you know, it's funny. Uh, you quoted someone saying that China, when China is backed into a corner. Is in fact, the Hong Kong people are being backed into a corner, not, not Beijing. There are ways to govern Hong Kong much better uh, rather than, than backing the Hong Kong people, the protesters, into a corner. Um, I just wish to add that Hong Kong uh, is the only genuine international financial center. And uh, if you start losing confidence from the international investors and community, of course it will harm Hong Kong, it will harm Hong Kong people, and it will also harm Beijing's interest. So basically by sending troops, be it the army or the people's police, that will rock the boat. That will not only harm Hong Kong's people, but that will also fundamentally damage Beijing's interest. So is that what Beijing wants? That is my question. But you, we both said this morning when we were talking ahead of coming on stage that you see, um, you see things as having come to an impasse, that, that things are deadlocked, and that it's very hard for either side to, um, to 
climb down. Is there anyone, any institution or person or uh, outside party or inside party that you can envision playing some sort of uh, intermediary or or um, moderating role in um, um, trying to come come to some sort of agreement. You know, a lot of people uh, in uh, Hong Kong society that are not as political as we are, but are highly respected individuals, like the former Chief Justice Andrew Lee, has openly called on the government to set up an independent commission of inquiry as a way out of uh, as for people to move on and to focus their energy on that this independent commission, so that people uh, will have a platform to uh, uh, air their complaints, their concerns, and, and the, uh, to deal with the abuses of uh, the police power. And all those issues will, would be uh, handled by this independent commission. Even the General Chamber of Commerce, which is usually very pro-establishment, uh, uh, pro-Beijing, they come out and say the independent commission is a very good idea. A lot of respectable people in Hong Kong who are not necessarily political has come out to support that. So, you know, if you want a way out, uh, that is really, the, I think, the common denominator, largest common denominator around the Hong Kong people. The thing about the Independent Commission of Inquiry, it is a, it, why is it that people want that? It's because it is a symbol of what Hong Kong still believes in, which is due process and impartiality of justice. The commission will be chaired by a judge, a respectable judge, looking at all these issues. And this is what Hong Kongers believe in. Um, and, but you know, the chief executive so far has, has, has refused to, to even consider. Has she actually, uh, has she actually definitively yeah. refused well, she that? She openly refused yeah. that. But for your information, it's not something so new in Hong Kong. It's not totally unprecedented. In fact, nine months ago, the chief executive set up uh, a same commission to look into a scandal uh, over a metro station uh, infrastructure issues and I mean, also chaired by a judge. So is this something so new to Hong Kong? No, absolutely but not. So far she's resolutely refused it again and again the, the, the suggestion that the independent commission has uh, to be set up, which is uh, I don't get it. I don't understand why she, she would take that position. All right, I want to start giving all of you a chance to ask questions. So again, uh, raise your hand. Uh, if I call on you, someone will bring you a microphone. And then please um, stand when you, uh, when you speak. Um, start right up here with Ian. Yeah, I have two, <coughs> two questions, one specific and one general. The specific one is you talked about the businessmen who support this movement. Um, there are also very um, powerful tycoons with big business interests in China. Yeah. Could you say something about how they are moving uh, in the present circumstances? The second question is, you talk about liberal democracy, and we're all, of course, completely sympathetic, but can um, an authoritarian state really afford to have part of its country being a complete liberal democracy? Because as it is, most people in China already think the Hong Kong people are overprivileged, spoiled, and so on. And so if the Hong Kong people have full liberal democracy, most other Chinese are going to ask, well, why them and not us? Yeah. Maybe I'll deal with the first one. Sure. Yeah. You know, the business community in Hong Kong, I have to say, has been quite disappointing over the years. You know, um, they have seen how one country, two system has been consistently undermined over the years. But they have <laughs> stayed pretty much silent or sided with the uh, pro-establishment side all these years. Um, thinking that, oh, uh, so long as it doesn't touch my pocket, so long as it doesn't affect my business interests, I'm not going to care about uh, how under one country, two system, or whether people should have democracy or, or human rights uh, protected. But we've seen a uh, slightly different thing happening over this extradition bill is that a lot of chambers of commerce have spoken out. A lot of business people say, hey, this is a really bad thing. Um, I think it's a little too late, I would say that, to the business community and the business leaders. It's far too late for you to then speak out now because you have stayed silent over the years when one country, two system has been undermined. And the reason why the government thinks that it could do this extradition bill is because in Chinese, they think they have enough votes that they could just ram this thing through 
No one uh, would, would be able to stop us because we have the votes. Because the system is rigged, we have the votes in Leshko, we could do this thing. Beca and the reason why we're in this position is because over the two past two decades, we have not worked hard enough in overall as a community, including the business sector, to advance our system of government, to improve governance overall in Hong Kong. That is what got us into this position. So you ask me, I've been very disappointed with the business community. I hope that will change starting now from now, but I'm not optimistic. And when we talk about liberal democracy values, we are not talking about something so abstract that is not happening. In fact, Hong Kong has been practicing liberal, liberal democracy values uh, over the past you know, 100 years. Uh, that makes Hong Kong successful, in fact. And how are we going to sustain and protect an international financial center? We need all these values, including free flow of information, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, and also, most importantly, the rule of law. These are also essential uh, to sustain this international financial center, and they happen to be liberal democracy values. And if China is so against it, then why on earth, in the first place, they promise one country, two systems, and take full advantage of this system? over the past 20 years. So again, Hong Kong people are not asking for the moon. We are simply asking for something that was promised in the basic law. And remember, Deng Xiaoping proposed one country, two systems, uh, uh, not only as a solution for, for, for Hong Kong, but also potentially for Taiwan. But guess what? Our Taiwanese friends are not buying it. You know, they, they look at Hong Kong and say, we ain't buying one country, two system because we don't, wa we don't want tear gas uh, or expired tear gas. Uh, uh, you know, and rubber bullets to, to be shot at uh, our, our younger generation. So, you know, if someone is thinking about this strategically, it would be in the interest of China as a whole if one country, two system, as originally designed, is to work in that way. That would actually be uh, intricately linked and helpful to the Taiwanese situation as well. But hey, you know, the Taiwanese people, they're they looking at Hong Kong. You know, I, I, I have every sympathy for, for their views. Let's take a few more. Um, yes, here in the, on the aisle. So first of all, thank you for coming. Um, you, you've been talking about one country, two systems, but one country, two systems has an expiration date in 2047. So how do you see this playing out in the long term? Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's no, we do not have an expiry date state so clearly in the basic law that the basic law, our mini constitution, will uh, become paper, useless by, say, uh, the 30th of July, 2047. No, it's not that. It's a promise made by Deng Xiaoping in the first place. He said that this system could run for 50 years, and if 50 years is not enough, we can give Hong Kong another 50 years, and hoping that by the time of the end of the 50 year, China could catch up to Hong Kong's standard. That was the original design and intention. Uh, of course, everybody talks about 2047, but when I speak to uh, youngsters, I tell them, yes, it's worrying because by the time of 2047, you'll be in, in your mid-40s. I understand that you are frustrated. But before we talk about 2047, we talk about 2037, we have 2027. We have time to lay foundation leading up to 2047. And by what I mean laying foundation, we have to do everything we can to earn our bargaining chips because by the time uh, when Beijing in a few the future Beijing government, when they wish to either extend or whether to preserve what's going on, they will have to talk to Hong Kong people. And what do we have to negotiate with Beijing? It has to be something that we have to start laying foundations. Which is the democratic foundation we're talking about, democracy, universal suffrage. And I think it is, you know, a lot of people raise that question, hey, it's all going to be over anyway in 2047. Why bother uh, uh, trying to preserve what we have? I think to take that attitude is are very irresponsible, uh, to, especially to the young people. Hey, I'll be 60-something and maybe retired by 2047. How about the, my kids? How about the next generation? They'll be in the you know, mid-career mid trying to build a family and prepare. Is it, is it responsible for us to tell them, look, it's going to be over anyway, so why not? Don't bother. Uh, no, we should preserve our way of life. And the key it goes back to universal suffrage, as promised under the basic law. We have a question from somebody online that sort of relates to this. It's from Rebecca. Uh, she asks, what do you see as your role in stopping the violence from the more extreme protesters? And I would just add to that. I mean, clearly, um, there are protesters who see violence now as a necessary tactic. Um, there are probably people who are 
using some degree of violence out of a sense of desperation or um, a sense of resignation or belief yeah. that, that there is, you know, all, all hope is lost. A as legislators, what, you know, wh how do you see your role in, in managing that? First of all, I, I think, um, you know, what happened at the airport, uh, some of the violent, uh, you know, incidents is, is regrettable. And, uh, but the, the, the young people uh, have a ability to self-reflect and self-criticize. They've actually issued an apology uh, to, to all the people who've been affected. I think that this is a quality that the young people have. But how about the adults, especially the adults in uh, the Hong Kong government? Are they self-reflecting and asking questions? Why has this gotten to this stage? What has happened? What has gone wrong? How, how, are they really sincere about apologizing and really think about why we're in this place? You're the ones in power. You're the adults in power. So if there is no self-reflection by those in power and also in Beijing, no self-reflection, no self-criticism, no asking the questions why we're in this state, you know, what do you expect? Uh, 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 from the rest of the community when our political leaders do not have that ability. And uh, the civil society are trying very hard to you know, have more peaceful demonstrations instead of uh, any violence. But again, it's the government who refused and granted permission to have peaceful demonstrations. Uh, a very updated inf piece of inma information for you is the civil uh, United Fr Civil Human Rights Front, that is the organizer of the Million People March, they tried to apply for a permit to have a peaceful march uh, on coming Sunday on the 18th, but they, were, they got declined. They were rejected from having an other peaceful march. Then Their previous applications have all been granted. Exactly, and all previous uh, applications were peaceful. And the, this restriction of uh, uh, freedom of assembly and freedom of speech is not going to resolve it. You know, the problem is, I'll say to Rebecca, the problem is that every time you see a massive protest, a massive discontentment in the Hong Kong society, instead of going to the root of the problem, they apply tear gas, they apply police baton, they apply uh, a court injunction order, hoping that will, you know, it's like someone who's seriously ill. And every time the symptoms come out, you just give that guy painkillers, uh, uh, hoping that it will just, you know, cover no, it not, up. Not even painkillers. Maybe orange juice. Oh, expired painkillers. <laughs> expired painkillers. <laughs> Hoping that will go away. But in, it's not going to address the, 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 the serious health issue that that person is, is, is going through. And Hong Kong is similar. Hong Kong is ill. Hong Kong is sick. There are ways to cure that sickness. But as politicians, we try to get Hong Kong to a place where we, we want a good system of government democracy, due process, rule of law, preserving the independence of the judiciary, which, by the way, I have to say, the judiciary in Hong Kong is still fiercely independent. There's no question about that. We have the top quality judges, and some of the best judges around the common law jurisdiction will sit in our court of final appeal. And the legal profession, which I represent, I proudly represent, is fiercely independent and very professional. And we, at every turn, when we see the rule of law is being undermined or challenged, the legal community always speaks out, and the extradition bill was no exception. Let's take some more questions. Uh, in the back here, uh, Minky. Yeah. Thank you uh, for coming from Hong Kong to explain Hong Kong people's very modest aspirations. I think um, uh, Beijing is very fortunate to have Hong Kong people who are so patient and waiting for democracy for many decades, so modest in your aspirations and so peaceful in expressing them. Can you talk about, you're both legislators in Hong Kong, can you speak to the um, essential problem that may be pushing Hong Kong people onto the streets? And that is that Hong Kong's legislature is controlled by pro-Beijing forces. You alluded to it, but could you explain how it is that there that you can be elected as a democratic legislator, but then you can't legislate, um, and how that may fixing that problem may indeed be one of the ways forward? You want to try? Well, simply speaking, to those who are not entirely familiar with the Hong Kong system, uh, the legislature of Hong Kong divided into two constituencies. One is the geographical constituency and people can directly elect their members. And the other part is the functional constituency. Guys like me. 
and the privileged guys. Um, in the functional constituencies, it divided into different sectors, including the legal sector, education, medical, and of course, business sectors. And not everybody gets a vote in those sectors. Uh, in the legal profession, of course, it's, it makes more sense because as a lawyer, you get qualified to vote for your own representative. But say in the business sector, not, you do not own a business and you automatically get a right, right to vote. You have to be registered to those different chamber of commerce. And of course, those are controlled by the pro Beijing camp. And so this is why uh, we do not see that this legislature can really function and legislate, as Minky pointed out. Um, we say not only the chief ex executive needs to reform, that we, have to, we need use universal suffrage to choose our own chief executive and also to abolish functional constituency so that LegCo can fully represent Hong Kong people's will. We're getting tons of questions from online, which is okay. exciting because it means people good. are watching, and, and they're all really good. So. Um, uh, Cedric asks via Twitter, uh, are you speaking to anyone in the establishment to find common ground, either someone in the Hong Kong government or people close to Beijing? And uh, will you lobby the U.S. government for help? Uh, we are not here to lobby the U.S. government. Uh, we are here to tell the truth, and we trust those in power in America. They will find out what's going on, and they will make a sound choice. So for the record, for the Chinese embassy, we are no lobbyists here. Um, well, well, and I think, I think it's important, establishment but, but I, I don't think we should skirt the issue about the Human Rights and Democracy Act that Congress is about to deliberate. As Alvin said, we are here to talk to political establishment. We have a U.S.-Hong Kong dialogue next week in Montana, where uh, legislators from different sides from Hong Kong will be meeting with uh, congressmen and senators from both parties, and we'll have a sit down few days to talk about Hong Kong. And of course, we will give what we believe is what's happening. And for these uh, congressmen and senators to take them back to Washington, DC, and decide for themselves what they're going to do with it. But I think I want to say to Cedric that um, the international community is important for Hong Kong for, for the reasons that we've, we've mentioned. And uh, the Hong Kong people understand that um, in order to work, for Hong Kong to work. Of course, people need to have good, rational discussion. And we do, of course, talk to officials from time to time and from ministers. In our line of work as legislator, that's, it's almost impossible to, to, to not talk to people in, in the government, of course. And I would say, uh, uh, hand on heart, that we have been trying very hard to make it work despite all the challenges and difficulties, making it work by supporting government policies where it is genuinely good for Hong Kong, and uh, disagreeing with them when we think it's bad. Um, but I don't think that system of um, back, and, you know, back and forth, give and take, is, uh, is, is working anymore, as seen in the extradition bill. We've proposed many alternatives. Alvin has proposed many alternatives. The legal profession has pro pro proposed many alternatives because there are ways to deal with this Taiwanese murder case without the need of removing the entire firewall. But all these proposals were shot down right from the start by the government without even any proper consideration. What, what kind of system of consultation is that? So you know, that's where we are. Um. Sorry, I'm just trying to see way in the back. Yes, way, way in the back. A, a the gentleman, gentleman with the laptop. Um, hi, good morning. Um, I'm a uh, Hong Kong um, law graduate here working in New York. And uh, my question um, concerns the, um, what the international community can do in terms of approach, not just the US, but the international community of which the US is part. And the background of this question is that, as you have, as you know, and as uh, as has been discussed, China is playing um, the old tactic of um, dividing um, us and other um, nationalist um, education. Um, what the U.S. did in Syria, for example, um, so they have this profound, perhaps justified, uh, grievance towards the international community towards the West. And here, so Hong Kong girls understandably want to seek 
international assistance, which is why perhaps you're here, would that not play into the hand of the Chinese government, give them ammunition to further politicize mm -hmm. these governments? My classmates from the mainland, for example, who, who genuinely fear that we are the bad guys here, wouldn't it further exacerbate the polarization between the two sides? Yeah. Thank well, you. Well, always good to have a Hong Honger. Welcome. Um, we, they're, of course, calling us names already uh, and you know, saying that we're colluding with foreign forces. But you know, if you're watching this program, uh, this is what we do here. And also, in, well, I've been to Germany, I've been to the EU, to the UK, speaking to our friends and partners there who care about Hong Kong. This is the sort of discussion we have. And if you call this, oh, this is collusion, then this is unacceptable. You, you, you're playing in the hands of uh, foreign forces. I, I refuse to believe that because part of being in uh, uh, the civilized world is that we have discussion, face-to-face -face discussion like this kind. So we talk about problems. And I don't think we overstepping any lines here. And the, you know, the, the, the Chinese press or the, 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 the left, uh, uh, hard left press will, will continue to cause name. Well, they can stick around in their, in their little world, but we refuse to accept the notion that, that we have to be in Hong Kong uh, only and only talking to Hong Kong people about uh, our problems without connecting with the friends in, in the international community. May I just add, you can't have two bites of the cherry. You see, Hong Kong is an international financial center. You need recognition from the international community. But when international community sees something and try to speak up, you, uh, you tell them to shut up. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You want their investments without their comments. You want their money without them contributing to, to the success of Hong Kong. It doesn't make sense. And one thing, uh, we've got so used to being labeled as the bad guys, so it doesn't matter that they continue to label us as such. Uh, and there's a Chinese saying that um, you shut the door and start beating up your own sons. And Hong Kong is not an island. Thank God that there's international attention to what's happening in Hong Kong. Otherwise, we would be the sons being beaten up by the parents. So this is why we are here, and this is why we expect that Hong Kong, as an international financial center, will continue to enjoy international attention. Yes. Uh, hi. Thank you both so much. I'm just trying to understand, leaving aside for a moment um, the morality and the principles where you have my complete sympathy. Just the tactics here, uh, particularly for the Beijing government. Who has any actual influence on Beijing? I mean, I, I see one point of view where you say, if I'm the Beijing government, if a million people go out in the streets and the international community makes a lot of noise and uh, you know, e even members of the local business community get upset, who cares? We're just going to do what we want. So my question is, who has an actual, who has actual clout uh, with the Beijing government where Beijing might actually say, ooh, wait, actually that's an outcome we're really worried about. We, have to, we might actually have to make some changes here. Well, this role is supposed to be played by our political leaders in government. They go to see, uh, it is Carrie Lam who goes to see President Xi Jinping, not us. But when she goes to see President Xi, is she standing up for Hong Kong people? Is she arguing Hong Kong people's case? Why does she... Uh, uh, tell the central people's government that this extradition bill is a good thing in the first place. Why doesn't she, sh uh, she see things from the Hong Kong people's point of view and see and understand their worries and fears about the Chinese legal system? So to answer your question, they are supposed to do that. They are supposed to go and argue our case uh, uh, the same way that some you know, you know, uh, people who have access to uh, uh, the political leadership uh, I know uh, do that. But the Hong Kong government is supposed to take up that role, and they're not doing a good job. And we expect that the senior Chinese leadership, they would have information to everything, including those from the pro-Beijing camp and including those from the opposition. So we expect that, you know, this is live stream, and we are probably speaking to somebody who's watching us in Beijing right now. So you can take notes properly and send it over to President Xi for his information. Um, we have another question from the audience that somewhat relates to this, um, which is that the and we were talking about this earlier that the, the fact that the pro, that the movement is largely leaderless now, 
um, and that it's adhering to this uh, Bruce Lee-inspired principle of be water, um, has had some real advantages um, in terms of people's ability to get out onto the streets and then get away from the, the police. Um, does it create disadvantages to um, to sort of uh, discussions of, of how the protests might end to not have leaders? Or how, how do you see the sort of the pros and cons of the fact that this is uh, a leaderless movement? Uh, to those who are not entirely familiar of what Susie just talked about, uh, this movement has a very interesting characteristic. That is, we do not have a symbol of uh, uh, from the protesters. We do not have a leader. Uh, it's decentralized movement. And so it enables everybody to contribute and participate in his or her own way and be creative and contribute in different uh, ways, including those who were in New York. Um, they, those Hong Kong people in New York also helping a lot to make this visible in the inter international community. Uh, but of course, we have to accept that the advantage of this movement is also a disadvantage to a certain extent. That is, we do not have a leader. And so since we do not have somebody who can really represent the protests, um, there's no way we could negotiate directly to somebody. But again, when we're asking how we could end this, we go back to the demands of the people. And we think about, are, this, are those demands so outrageous and unreasonable? by say, formally withdrawing the bill? Is it, do, do we have to negotiate terms on this? Another no. question from somebody online was that, you know, that Carrie Lam has said the bill is dead. Mm -hmm. So then, why is formal withdrawal so important? Because formally it is still on the table of the Legislative Council. And to withdraw it requires a piece of paper from the government to our president of LegCo saying oh, we're going to withdraw it. Why can't you do it? You, you, you want a good end to this uh, for Hong Kong? You don't want to push Hong Kong people down into the abyss, to quote Carrie Lam, but then withdraw the bill. Uh, uh, you know, uh, why should people trust your words, given what has happened? Uh, uh, if you think it's really dead, dead, then withdraw it uh, from the table of the Legislative Council. It's pure and simple as that. And we do not need to negotiate on an independent commission of inquiry to look into what had happened, right? This is something so reasonable and something so simple that any sensible government would have done. I think we have time for two or three more. Yes, all the way in the very back. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a question in regard to the rumors we hear about a military crackdown by the PLA mm -hmm. on Hong Kong's protesters. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see this playing out with neighbors in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, and as you said, particularly in Taiwan, which is being enticed to come in quotes to the motherland's fold? Thank you. Uh, we have rumors from uh, We've, we read reports from uh, media that uh, the Chinese military, they uh, sneak into Hong Kong and pretend to be Hong Kong police. But we have no, I do not have any evidence to suggest that. But people do believe that some of the police uh, who dressed in uh, uh, uniforms without any numbers or identity, they could be members of the PLA or the People's uh, uh, Police. Uh, it, it might be possible, it might not be possible, we do not know. Uh, the, Ch the Ch Hong Kong police force has officially declined that uh, and said that it's not possible. But then Hong Kong people do have sufficient uh, grounds to believe so because the Chinese Communist Party can do anything uh, out of the line. Um, and, but still, as mentioned a bit earlier, I still believe that it is not to the interest of Beijing to send the troops to Hong Kong and start cracking down our protests because it will rock the boat. It will uh, certify the end of one country, two systems. It will send the wrongest message to the rest of the world. And I do not think international investors will come back. So that will harm Hong Kong people, but also harm Beijing. Somebody from 
online asks whether the protests are affecting real estate prices in Hong Kong. Well, that would be welcoming news for some because uh, you know the property prices in Hong Kong are so outrageously unaffordable uh, that um, you know since Carrie Lam took office, uh, the, the the prices has uh, kept going up, and I think you know. Well, you know, people ask the question, hey, you, aren't you worried about the, the economic cost of these protests? Of course I'm worried. Of course I'm concerned. But what I'm even more concerned about is the long-term future of Hong Kong. And this has become an existential question for uh, a lot of Hong Kong people, is can Hong Kong con continue to survive and thrive in the long run? So I would tell those people who are thinking about economic cost is that, look, first of all, think about the long-term bigger future of Hong Kong, that the protesters are really uh, uh, concerned about that. The young people are concerned about that, and they're right to do so. And if we don't fix the fundamental problem that is facing Hong Kong, our economic future will be out the window anyway. And just imagine if you have this near your, where you live on a, on a weekly basis, and of course you would have uh, dropped the property price, right? But is that what we really want? And as Dennis just mentioned, you need Hong Kong people in the future. And if you do not satisfy our youngsters today, how are we going to count on them in the future? Society is not built on property prices or bricks and mortars. It is not built on money. It is built on the quality people. of the people and their lives. And that is what is at stake here. Do you have a program? Oh, sorry, you need to wait for a microphone. for reducing economic inequality in the sense that economic inequality seems to be especially pronounced in Hong Kong, the United States, a number of other financial capitals in the world, and it seems to be creating a pretty strong counter force, populist force. I'm um, going to repeat so that just because I'm just going to repeat that since it wasn't on the microphone. But the, the question was about a plan for combating economic inequality in Hong Kong uh, related to the dramatic economic inequality in many major yeah. cities around the world and the populist backlash to that inequality. You know, apart from issues like democracy and the rule of law that we uh, always talk about, in the legislature, in our line of work, we also talk about and uh, actively work for a more equal and fair society, especially the Democrats. We've been arguing for a universal pension plan for Hong Kong. We've been arguing for tougher legislation to, to have better environment, uh, better uh, uh, laws to control air pollution and climate change. Uh, the Democrats have been doing that, not the pro-establishment. We've been arguing that the government should be spending more on education. We are, we are sitting on, the government in Hong, of Hong Kong is sitting on billions of surplus, billions and billions of surplus, that they should be spending more on social welfare services and education so, so that, that the schools are, are, are improved. And we, the Democrats, have been arguing for that. And also better health care, better hospital, more hospitals. Uh, but the government is sitting on this massive wealth, and they worry about uh, uh, spending more. But at the same time, they think, oh, I will give you a little tax cut here and there. I'll give you $8,000 per year or of handouts. They think that will solve the, 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 the social discontentment. Uh, dream on, you know. It's not going to re resolve it. I think there was a question here. Do you still have it? Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, so I was also born in Hong Kong but raised in New York. Um, but my question to you, I guess, for Two questions. First off is um, why do you believe that things are going so fast in such a pace that um, just a couple months ago when the movement wasn't so large, um, police wasn't using these tear gas tactics uh, to get protesters out the way? Um, and the second question is how important is it for those arrested to be let out either on bail or released completely? Uh, to the whole entire protest. Okay. Um, so what contribute 
to the escalation or the progress of this movement? Well, blame the police. Blame the triad members who came all the way to the train station and start beating up people. I mean, all these incidents triggered people and contribute to the angers of the general public. I mean, this is most unacceptable. By colluding with mobs and sending them to train stations in a residential area and beating up people, this is unacceptable. And this is the foundation why people are not happy and cannot trust this government and the police force anymore. So if this government is wondering why the movement is progressing so dramatically, they have themselves to blame. Hello, good morning. I'm Oz from Hong Kong. I'm very happy to see you here. Thanks for coming all the way. Um, so the escalation, from my point of view, really did start on June 12th, when the police first started using extreme measures against the protesters. Do you think it's a miscalculation on the government's part, or is there a long-term agenda? Uh, well, if there is a long-term agenda, I would wonder, what is the long-term agenda? By creating all this chaos, um, I, I believe it's a miscalculation. I believe it is... Uh, Serious misjudgment yeah. on especially the part of the chief executive, Kerry Lam, in thinking that the Hong Kong people will somehow swallow this extradition thing, uh, uh, you know, that the, the, the Hong Kong people will, will, will stay home and just accept this as a, a fact of life. That is where she got it totally wrong, totally wrong. And it is her big error of judgment that has caused all this problem that we're seeing now. Do you think she, the protests can end with Carrie Lam still in her current position? Um, I think the credibility of the government, uh, the uh, acceptability of the Hong Kong government in the eyes of most Hong Kong people is completely gone. Uh, and the problem does not only lie with Carrie Lam, of course she is the leader of the government, but this whole system of government is no longer uh, something that Hong Kong people look up to and trust. And even after she is gone, she'll be gone one day, I don't know when, I, I'm not going to make any predictions because my staff pointed out I keep making wrong predictions, <laughs> so I'm not going to make any more predictions. Um, but she will be gone one day, but whoever takes her place next, whoever becomes the next chief executive, will continue to have this problem. Hong Kong people will not say, oh, okay, the new guy, let's hope that he or she will be better. Because we've had so many bad chief executives, so many bad series of government ministers over the years that people are just sick and tired. Even whoever you put up there, it's just going to be a lackey of Beijing. So what good is that? <coughs> All right. Last one. Make it a good one. Do we have time for one more? Thank you. Um, what do you say to those people who say ultimately China's goal is to build up Shanghai or other Chinese cities as international financial centers. Um, and that's ultimately their motivation and to draw, draw this away from Hong Kong to their own mainland cities. You know, um, uh, 10 years ago, five, 10 years ago, um, we hear a lot of that, that, uh, oh, Shanghai is going to take over Hong Kong as an international fin financial center. Or, you know, they would replicate 10 Hong Kongs in mainland China that they will no longer need Hong Kong. Well, that hasn't happened. Uh, especially since the Shanghai stock market crash in 2015. No, people understand and realize that you can't have, you cannot have an international financial center without four things. The free flow of information, free flow of capital, the free flow of people, and the rule of law. All four things are intact in Hong Kong, whereas you can't find those four things uh, in any mainland city. So people understand that. Uh, Hong Kong is not and cannot be easily replaced, that um, Hong Kong plays a unique and disproportionately important role uh, to China. People, some people say, oh, well, Hong Kong only contributes 3% to, uh, to the overall GDP, but that is overlooking the important strategic role of Hong Kong as an international financial business center, where the rule of law, we have the common law, that English uh, is in our laws, that international investors can understand and access, that our regulatory system are uh, uh, practiced by regulators of international standards. 
uh, whether it is the HKMA, the Monetary Authority, or the Securities and Futures Commission, uh, the legal profession provide world-class professional services. All these things are unique to Hong Kong, and they play an important role. So I would say to those people, you know, don't I don't believe that Hong Kong could be easily replaced, and don't uh, undermine or talk down the, to the Hong Kong people as to the importance of Hong Kong. Um, since, so, and since this is the last question, and I would want to say that you know, the Hong Kong people has been talked down uh, by a lot of, of uh, people in the mainland, or talked down to by uh, by people in uh, Beijing or in in the government, and, and that's just wrong. That that is wrong. Hong Kong people have shown time and again that they are of exceptional quality. So Hong Kong yet, <laughs> All right. Well, I speak on behalf of Asia Society, and I think uh, on behalf of everybody here, in saying we will all be watching uh, the news from Hong Kong uh, very, very closely. And we are very grateful that you've illuminated it as well as you have for us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much.